This episode of Luke's English Podcast is sponsored by italki. Italki is a service that will help you to get fluent in English with a one-to-one language teacher. You can use italki to speak English and get English lessons with native English speakers and qualified teachers. It's convenient. You can learn with a teacher from the comfort of your home. No need to travel to class or study abroad to be immersed in a language. You can do it over the internet now. It's affordable. There are hundreds of teachers that you can choose from and you can find a teacher that fits your learning style and your budget. And it's professional. With italki, you can browse profiles of professional teachers and choose a teacher based on their experience and also reviews from other students like you. Okay, And because you listen to this podcast, italki are offering you a free lesson when you buy some talking time. To get that offer and for more information, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or click an italki logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. In this episode, I'm talking to my dad again about Brexit. We've been covering this story, the Brexit story, in episodes of the Rick Thompson Report since before the referendum in June 2016. Long-term listeners will know you will have heard those episodes. These episodes that we do tend to be popular because although Brexit is a complex situation, my dad is able to speak clearly on the subject, both in terms of his accent and also in terms of how he presents his ideas. He's very clear. This one is going to be a double episode. You are currently listening to part one. In this first part, I wanted to just talk to my dad about three main things, three questions. What happened last week in the House of Commons, in Parliament? What's happening now? And what is likely to happen next? So we spoke yesterday, and it took us over an hour to answer those three questions, because they're not very easy questions to answer due to the complex nature of the current situation. There are lots of things to talk about, as usual. Uh, But that's what you're going to listen to in this first part. Mainly my dad answering those three questions. What happened last week? What's happening now? And what's likely to happen next? Then in part two of this double episode, I ask my dad some questions which I've received from social media, from listeners on social media. I asked my followers on Twitter, uh, fans of the Facebook page, and also people on my website. I asked them if they had any questions for my dad about Brexit. And so in part two of this episode, you'll hear my dad responding to those questions. So this is part one. And this first part is a general report on the current Brexit situation or Brexit shambles, as perhaps it it should be called. A shamble is is basically a a state of disorder, like a disorganized mess is a shambles. So this first part is a report on the Brexit shambles. And then the next part will be a Brexit Q&A, a a question and answer session, as I said just now. The last time I talked to Dad on the podcast about Brexit, it was November. And at that time, Theresa May had just managed to get agreement from the EU for a Brexit deal. So just a little bit of background story before we get started properly. Basically, after the referendum in 2016 in which 51.9% of people voted to leave the EU and 48.9% voted to remain. And the turnout for that uh, referendum was 72.2% of the population. And of that 72.2%, 51.9% voted to leave and uh, 48.9% voted to stay. So after that referendum, the result of which was to leave the EU, And after David Cameron resigned, the the Prime Minister at the time, after he resigned and Theresa May became the Prime Minister, and everyone wondered what was going to happen, and she said, Brexit means Brexit. And nobody really knew what that meant, because it didn't actually mean anything. Everyone was thinking, what's going to happen? What will happen? Are you going to trigger Article 50? Is Brexit actually going to happen? What kind of Brexit will there be? And Theresa May's response, well, everyone, Brexit means Brexit. And we all went, uh, okay. 
Imagine if I, as an English teacher, defined words and concepts like that. Imagine that. Teacher, teacher, what does, what does shambles mean? Well, it's very simple. Shambles means shambles. Let me be absolutely clear when I say that shambles means shambles, okay? There you go, strong and stable English teaching, that would be. Anyway, after Theresa May clearly said Brexit means Brexit and the UK government triggered Article 50 to begin the formal process of the UK leaving the EU, even though there was no leaving plan in place, uh, the, the clock started ticking and Theresa May and her government attempted to start negotiating with the EU to create an exit plan that both sides could agree on. So even though none of the actual specifics of leaving the EU had been defined, except that Brexit meant Brexit and that she had to carry out the will of the people, well, the will of 51.9% of 72% of the people, which is actually about 35% of the people, she attempted to negotiate some kind of agreement with the EU, an agreement to define the terms not only of our exit from the Union, but also for our entry back into a new relationship with our largest trading partner and closest neighbour, a deal that was surely destined to be unsatisfactory for almost everyone because of all the different views on what Brexit should look like. Despite all the problems, the resignations of members of her cabinet, the sticking points of the Northern Ireland problem, the single market, the customs union, the UK's outstanding financial commitments to the EU budget and so on. Despite these sticking points, Theresa May somehow managed to get a deal together that the EU accepted. So the EU basically said, OK, we don't like it. We'd rather you stayed, but we will accept these terms. Now you need to get your parliament to give the thumbs up too. And that's where we were last time in November, before all of the MPs, the members of Parliament in the House of Commons, in Parliament, in London, before all those MPs were due to vote on Theresa May's deal. The deal that took two years to sort out, but which nobody at home seemed to like. Parliament voted on the deal last week on Tuesday the 15th of January. And this brings us so those three main questions for my dad. Again, what happened last week, what's happening now, and what's going to happen next? And that's what we're going to talk about. So get ready for some fairly complex conversation about politics and the future of the UK as we know it in part one of this episode of the Rick Thompson Report on Luke's English Podcast. This is the Rick Thompson Report with Rick Thompson. Hello, Dad. Welcome back to the podcast. Hello, Luke. Nice to talk to you again. Nice to talk to you again, too. Um, a weather report comes first on the Rick Thompson report. And oh, may- yes. And maybe a clumsy comparison between the weather conditions and the current political climate. Uh, well, that might be more difficult. Uh, it's it's cold, mm-hmm. and the political climate is very chilly. <laughs> um, uh-huh. It's also um, becalmed. There is no wind in the middle of England at the moment. And uh, I suppose that's a parallel as well. There's uh, nothing moving at Westminster either. <laughs> Did you say becalmed? Becalmed. It's a, it's a, I think it's a maritime shipping word when your sailing ship hasn't got any wind and it's becalmed. So that means things that there's no wind and nothing is moving. That's right. Because that's not normally a phrase that you would say, oh, how's the weather? Oh, it's becalmed. Sorry. <laughs> well, sorry about that, but uh, that's what I thought of as a parallel with the Brexit process. Okay, very good. That's for all the the, the people on on ships listening to that's this podcast. That's right, all those people listening. Yeah. Okay, so that's the weather done. Let's now move on to the Brexit situation or the B word. Yes, the B word. So let's try to talk about what happened last week with the vote on Theresa May's deal. What's happening now, and then what's likely to happen next? Well, I should tell you straight away and your listeners that nobody really knows what's going to happen next um i mean i can have a bit of a speculate mm-hmm. but i don't have any insights i don't uh, live inside the westminster bubble as they call it um and it, it's very unclear what's going to happen next but we can lay out the possibilities yeah okay as people probably know um Theresa may struck this deal it was signed off by the eu uh, and it's basically a long 585-page document, which is uh, all about the withdrawal agreement. 
And when that's agreed and it's legally binding, then they go on to the future relationship, which is a political protocol, which is not legally binding. And having gone through all that, it was going to go to the House of Commons in a so-called meaningful vote for the MPs to decide whether to accept this agreement or not. And uh, they roundly rejected it with a record-breaking defeat for the government of a a defeat of 230 votes. And uh, the reaction from the government was to say, right, well, we'll um, look at it again and go back to the EU for some more clarification and bring it back to the Commons for another vote, which will happen on the 29th of January. Uh Um, So we're waiting for that. Uh, In the meantime... Um, the leader of the opposition, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn, proposed a, a vote of no confidence in the government, which is the method you trigger a general election. If uh, the House of Commons has no confidence in the government, then uh, there are 14 days for a new government to be formed. Um, and he lost that because uh, the Conservatives and uh, other parties uh, don't want a general election and they don't want to see the possibility of Jeremy Corbyn being in number 10 Downing Street. And so they retire to their party camps and vote on party lines. And that was expected. But um, Corbyn basically said uh, it's kind of like constant uh, erosion of their authority. So he moved the motion of no confidence uh, to, as a basically as a as a tactic, not expecting to win it. Well, so what, that's gone by. I mean, I, I I think that if there was another vote of no confidence, the same result would happen. What kind of tactic? Because if he, if he knew that uh, they wouldn't win the vote of no confidence, why did he do it anyway? Com- commentators basically say it's a, it's a campaign of embarrassment. Mm. Uh, but I don't know why. You, but you can ask him, Luke. Just going to embarrass himself because the, the vote of no confidence was never going to win. I think he was under pressure by, from a lot of his uh, party members to try and get rid of the government. They, they desperately want a general election. So it's just basically, well, it's worth a try. It probably won't work, but it's worth a try. You never Something know. Something like that, yeah. Okay, I see. Um, so all of these are very big questions, which obviously you can you uh, have the right not to know the answer to. But the question is, why was the deal rejected by such a large margin? 230, well, it was, what was what was the result? Eight. It was 435 against and 200 and 204. Oh, I've got the, I've got the results here. Uh the the no's the people who rejected uh, the deal in the vote uh, was four hundred and thirty two, and the people who said yes, the eyes were two hundred and two hundred and two. So it was a difference of two hundred and thirty. So why That's did right. so many people across different parties vote against the deal? A, a whopping great defeat. Um, first of all, the, the obviously the Labour Party aren't going to vote for the for the Tory government anyway. Um, because, as I said, they want to force a general election. They think the government is a terrible shambles. And it's not just about Brexit. It, it's also about their record uh, in social programs and uh, economy. But um, most of the MPs who voted it down uh, didn't like the deal for different reasons. I mean, hardly anybody liked this deal because um, it doesn't solve the problems. And it means that, you know, we would leave the EU at the end of March but continue to negotiate for probably two years on the future trading arrangements and and all sorts of other things without having any presence in Brussels or any members of the European Parliament in a terrible negotiating position, really. Um, and, And the crucial points were this thing about where's the border between the UK and Ireland, EU member state, where's the border? And the, uh, the deal that, Theresa May put forward had this famous word the backstop in it which is there won't be a hard border on the island of Ireland Uh, nobody wants that Ireland certainly doesn't want it UK doesn't want it so Northern Ireland would effectively become different from the rest of the UK because they would have to have certain kinds of um, trade regulations between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK Uh, and the Democratic Unionists who support the government at the moment, in fact, they're propping up Theresa May, giving her a majority. They are absolutely adamant that there can't be any difference between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK. 
And Theresa May said, well, it'll be a temporary backstop until we've sorted out our future deal on trade with the EU. Well, that wasn't good enough. Temporary could go on forever. Mm. And um, no one knows how it would work anyway. Um, if you're going to have a border down through the Irish Sea, how are you going to get rid of it? So nobody really wants to see a, a kind of breakup of the UK in that way. But who actually supports the backstop? Who actually likes it? Well, the, you know, there were 200 mainly Conservative MPs who voted loyally for the Prime Minister, thinking, well, it gives us some time to sort things out. OK, so it's just purely kind of strategic on party political lines that people supported the deal, even though the backstop is not going to make anyone happy. Well, the, the, the deal has led to resignations from Mrs May's cabinet, several of them, including two Brexit secretaries, who think it's a rotten deal. Um, those who are very hard line want to just leave the EU also didn't like it. Uh, they, they would rather say, oh, to hell with it. We'll just leave the so-called uh, no deal Brexit or hard Brexit. Crashing well, out. They are in a minority, but they, they, uh, they didn't like the deal either. So, um, it, it didn't command any kind of support and it was embarrassing for the government, but it shows how deeply divided the political classes are. That the referendum vote in 2016 divided the populace almost down the middle. It divided the nations of the UK. Scotland voted to remain. Northern Ireland voted to remain. London voted to remain. But the rest of England and Wales voted to leave. Um, and the parties themselves were split. So old party politics doesn't work very well in this situation. The Conservative Party has lots of Remainer MPs and Leave MPs, and so does the Labour Party, reflecting their constituencies. If you're an MP and your constituency voted strongly and decisively to leave the EU, um, it's uh, pretty well suicidal to say you don't accept what they said. Mm. Yeah, because they're going to um, so, vote you so out. So the, par the party lines uh, have been totally fractured. It's extremely interesting constitutionally, Luke. Uh, I hope your your listeners won't find that too too boring, but it actually is interesting mm. that the definitions of democracy have started to be discussed. Um, the UK is one of the early parliamentary democracies, some say the first. It's got traditions that parliament decides everything. Parliament makes the laws. It doesn't have an executive president with any power, you know, like Donald Trump or uh, Macron. But the government, sometimes people simply say number 10 Downing Street, the address of the prime minister, mm -hmm. the, the, the government has been trying to uh, get this process through without the MPs having a debate or discussion or vote on it. And now we've got a tussle for who's in control of the Brexit process. And after that vote we've just been talking about, where the government got so heavily defeated, in various ways, the MPs are trying to take back control of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what's going to happen in the next few days. I could tell you a bit more about that in a minute, if you like. Okay. Well, you can tell us a bit more about it now, why don't you? <laughs> okay. Well, the next sort of technical moves are that um, the adjusted deal, such as it might be, from Theresa May will go before MPs again on Tuesday the 29th of January. But um, at, on that day, there will be a lot of amendments to be voted on. And um, the amendments are put forward by groups of MPs. Uh, I think there are 10 of them. They won't all be discussed and voted on. That depends on the Speaker of the House of Commons selecting the ones he thinks are most relevant or have most support. And they range from delaying Brexit um, and blocking a no deal. That means... The MPs would say, whatever happens, we're not going to leave with no deal, which is highly unpopular, uh, you know, to do that. And if there was a vote like that, I think the MPs would vote to say there will be no deal. But what, what does that mean? There'll be no no deal. What, yeah, I know. But what does it mean? We say we, we, we will not leave with, without a deal. But what happens if we haven't got one and March the 29th comes along mm -hmm. um, by law? And it's our law, not just the EU's rules. Um, we would be out of the EU. So how, if you're going to block the idea of no deal, the first thing you have to do is extend the Article 50 process. This is the, uh, out of the treaties, the way we are leaving. 
Um, so it would, one amendment is delay Article 50 and vote the we will not have no deal Brexit. Mm -hmm. Another one, another amendment um, calls for debates on all aspects of this in the House of Commons, specifically uh, every two weeks in February, then every week in March with so-called indicative votes. These are votes on the issues uh, which they say would steer the government into the kind of deal that we would accept. For example, should we stay in the customs union? That might be one of the things to discuss. Mm -hmm. And Labour have put forward, the Labour Party have put forward their own amendment, which is to vote on membership of a customs union. And also, interestingly, whether they should legislate to hold a public vote on any proposed deal. That is a second referendum, though the Labour Party is not entirely united on this subject. They're not calling for a second referendum. This would be technically to allow a referendum to be called. And they say this leaves all options on the table. So you can see it's getting a bit tricky. Uh, another amendment calls for a citizens' assembly to be formed, 250 people representing various sectors of society to discuss and put forward their version of Brexit. I could just imagine how that wouldn't work. <laughs> no. um, you can uh, – there's another one, again, ruling out a no-deal Brexit. There's another one, straightforwardly, we should hold a second referendum. This is put forward by a, a number of doctors who are – MPs from different parties. And all these amendments have cross-party support. As I said, the parties have now been fractured. So the amendments have, you know, a conservative person who is uh, the name behind the amendment, but backed by, for example, an SNP MP and a, and a Labour MP. There are several on holding a series of indicative votes on the issues, such as, shall we have a Canada-style agreement? Shall we have a Norway-style agreement? So it's going to be a pretty strange day on 29th of January to have all these amendments, or some of them, being voted on before they vote on whether to accept Theresa May's deal, which, of course, they won't. So there are two uh, factions. There's the government, which is being led by Theresa May, and their aim is to... What's, what was the word for it? Update, change, uh, improve the deal that they that was previously voted down? Yes. It, what, what was the word? The, the, the newspapers using all sorts of different words, but they were saying they want clarification. Yeah, clarification, the right. So they, they want... Uh, the EU has said you can't reopen the negotiation. Uh, people call it sort of tinkering. But basically, um, Theresa May's government is saying, OK, so you, you rejected our deal. I'll go back to the EU and clarify it. Whatever the hell that means. Something like that. And they are talking about the the Irish border issue primarily. But essentially what that means is that she's going to attempt to go back to uh, Brussels and renegotiate certain aspects of the deal, probably the backstop. But I can't imagine how she's going to be able to get any significant change to the deal when the EU's position has been very clear from, from the beginning. I mean, it's just the same old story, her going back, attempting to renegotiate, and the EU saying, well, I'm sorry, it's still exactly the same situation. Yes, I agree with you, Luke. I mean, as your regular listeners will know, I am horrified at the idea of leaving the EU completely. You know, I am a pro-European so I'm not impartial on this, but I can try and give you an account of what others think. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, I, one of the things is that I, Theresa May is saying it's either my deal or no deal. She's saying that to who? To the Everybody. To, to everybody, okay. Uh, so the, the idea of March the 29th getting closer and closer, it's only 64 days away as I speak, mm -hmm. is thought to have concentrate minds and say, oh, well... It, we can't ha crash out of the EU because it would be disastrous for a number of reasons. So in the end, we'll have to accept Theresa May's deal, which has a transition period uh, where everything stays much the same while we negotiate our future relationship with the EU. And, you know, this is uh, like a, a game of chicken or, you know, Russian roulette that uh, if uh, the longer it goes on and the closer a no-deal Brexit comes – Theresa May probably thinks that people will come round to her way of thinking and say, well, this is better than nothing. So she's forcing people to accept her deal. She's like, 
as they say, kicking the can down the road. That's what that's the expression that uh, people are using. She's yes. kicking the can down the road, which basically means delaying the whole process in a way to force people to accept her deal because it will be either this or it's the oblivion of, of no deal. Um, yes, so, but why is she why is she so keen? Why is she holding on to her deal so so much? Well, um, she believes it's her mission to deliver Brexit. She believes that the referendum result has to be respected and it would be a, a terrible um, mistake um, to not uh, respect it. And so trying to juggle all the different views is uh, extremely difficult, to say the least. So she doesn't think you should have a second referendum. She said that many times. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't think we should remain in the EU. And she's trying to do a deal that will satisfy all these different factions within the Conservative Party. But she's failing because so she has failed. Yeah, no one's satisfied. When's she going to kind of admit defeat? Well, it's what I was saying earlier. The, the House of Commons, the Parliament, is now trying to take control of the process. They're, they're fed up with be, the, the Cabinet, Mrs May's top team, not coming up with solutions. And, uh, you know, they, they obviously think we've got to get a grip on this, find out what kind of a deal would command a majority in the house of commons and that's what all these kind of indicative votes on various issues is about trying so, to find out whether we can come up with something that a, that a majority can support um but there, there are still loads of unresolved issues and the the main one of course is the border the the eu has signed a legally binding agreement after a long period of negotiation more than two years and they say, look, there's got to be a border around the single market. Um, there is everywhere. You're either in the single market or you're not. They trade under different rules. So uh, tell us, where's the border going to be? The only land border we have with the EU is with the Republic of Ireland. If it's not going to be there, and we can talk about why not, then where is it, they say? And uh, the answer is, well, we're not quite sure. We're, we're you know, we're going to have some kind of... Um, different trading relationship between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK just to make sure goods and, and people could be checked. But this must be temporary. The border thing is important because when we talk about a border, naturally, we just think about a line. OK, but what would the border actually look like and how would it function the border between the single market of the eu and not the single market of the eu what does that what's the reality of that border and if you know why is it that we can't have a a land border between northern ireland and the republic of ireland or the uk and the eu in that particular place what what is the nature of this border it's not just a line is it It, well there are obviously borders uh, all the way around the eu um, and they affect uh, goods, services, and people. Within that border, there is free movement of goods, services, people, and capital under uh, you know, rules where there doesn't have to be any uh, different taxation regime or tariffs on goods. They f- trade completely freely within the EU. Outside the EU, uh, people trade on different rules, and if we were outside the um, the EU – Everyone seems to think we would have to resort to World Trade Organization tariffs. But I'm talking Um, about – sorry, I'm just talking about um, if you're a guy with a truck and you want to take your – let's say – because some people just don't seem to understand what that border really means – um, well, <laughs> you see, this is what I mean. It's just like in a very simple way. Like, what does the border look like, and what does it? How how easy it is, is it to go from one side of it to another? Well, we're an island, and the 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 trade with the rest of the EU is seamless. So, if you're, I mean, thousands of containers come in on boats every day. Thousands of uh, big trucks coming in and out of the UK every day through the Channel Tunnel on ferries. Um, if you're a Polish uh, operator who's selling goods to the UK, and we do you know, get a lot of goods from places like Poland, and you see their trucks on our roads all the time, you just drive along, you get onto the ferry, you drive off the other side. And um, it's the same if you're a, a person coming on holiday. Uh, you just flash your European passport and that's it. Well, in Ireland, um, you can cross from northern to Republic of Ireland – Absolutely freely. There is 
no border and the the border runs through all the countryside the irish countryside up little lanes uh, some farms are split by the border they have half their farm in the northern ireland half their farm in the republic uh, and there are lots and lots of little roads and little lanes and everything else at the moment it's completely open and that's the way everybody wants it to stay so if that's open uh eu goods people could go into Northern Ireland, but at that point, they would have to uh, conform to, e- to the, the rules to come into the UK or to have goods coming in from the UK into Ireland. Um, it, it, the, the amount of paperwork is minimal. People like the Road Haulage Association, the people who represent lorry drivers, say that uh, if we didn't have a deal all those trucks coming through to Calais um, on the Eurostar. Yeah. Um, at the moment, they, their average check for paperwork takes two minutes. Yeah. Uh, they say the average check would probably take 20 minutes, and it doesn't take a mathematician to say that there would be uh, a 10-kilometre-long queue of trucks on day two. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the government, as I said, some say it's kind of uh, scare tactics to mm. say we're preparing for a no-deal Brexit, but we certainly are preparing for a no-deal Brexit in a whole number of different ways. And one of them is using an airfield in Kent, which will be ready to be a massive truck park uh, for trucks waiting to get uh, to the other side of the channel or being held up having come across. I mean, that's the, there's just simply the, the backlog of trucks that we'd have yes, they, they and where would they to. where would they go in while they're waiting to go through customs that's right in the event of a no deal brexit we've got the backlog but also just the effect that that would have on people's businesses so if you're a, if, closing one of the motorways near dover yeah, the m act as a, a as a truck park the m26 they they they're one of the contingency plans is that they close the entire motorway and, you, and just fill it up with parked trucks i mean it's absolutely fantastic the trucks would be full of goods some of those goods would be perishable items that's right food maybe medicine essential medicines is a big issue actually the medicines probably coming you know it's coming medicines coming in although we have a lot of pharmaceutical uh, companies in the uk i think it's probably is both ways but you know if a big company like bayer in germany um you know they will be sending uh drugs into this country in large quantities uh and People are worrying about that, and the government has announced that it's stockpiling essential drugs. So, if you if you are um, a diabetic and you need um, a regular source of insulin, um, which is true for th- hundreds of thousands of people in the country, uh, you might be starting to get a bit worried that you have enough insulin, right? People but- are getting worried. The, the, the prospect of a of a no deal Brexit is pretty horrendous. Um, and, you know, there might be shortages of certain foodstuffs. Um, uh, the, the, um, the checks on, uh, on food would possibly be ignored coming into our country, hmm. but I don't think they'd be ignored the other way. The EU isn't going to suddenly have a non-EU member, uh, putting goods in which they're just going to wave through. But, you know, but sorry to stop you there, but if they just waved in the food coming in, that's a public health issue because, um, yes, I mean, for all we know, we're just accepting food that isn't healthy or safe. Yes, we. it, it may be regarded as being a technicality uh, because on day one, we're not suddenly going to get lots of uh, rubbish food coming in or going out. Um, but in, in a, a medium term, you've got to have um, some kind of legally binding rules and the we we lose all the EU rules at a stroke if we leave without a deal. Um, there are other things. I mean, people have even said aeroplanes won't be able to fly in and out of the country because they don't comply with EU regulations. That's so damaging to the other member states of the EU that I think there would be an instant deal that said the British regulations will be recognised. But I don't know. I'm speculating because none of us knows. Um, there are all sorts of other things that would happen with a no deal Brexit. One of them, of course, is would we be able to just travel to and fro easily? Mm-hmm. Um, Theresa May made a concession um, a couple of days ago. She had rather clumsily um, said that EU citizens who are resident in this country would have to apply 
to have a permission to stay document, mm-hmm. and this would cost sixty five euros or something, okay. or sixty five pounds, seventy euros. Yeah. Um, I mean, this was universally unpopular, and so it was what's called a U turn. A U turn is a turn when you turn your car around quickly and go the other way. A political U-turn is where you announce something. Then everybody says it's a really lousy idea. And they, so you reverse and say, oh, we're not going to do that after all. Yeah. So you turned on that. But the, the status of citizens um, is part of the withdrawal agreement, and it's supposed to be mutual. So uh, you, a British citizen living in France, might, um, you know, be concerned that the French authorities won't recognize you as a citizen. Um but again, we don't know. You know, if we have no deal, we don't know what the position will be. So we're talking now about the possibility of a no deal, and uh, or as they call it, crashing out of the EU, and what that might look like, and how damaging and dangerous that could be. Let me just back up a bit then. So Theresa May's first deal was rejected. And then she said, OK, I'll go and uh, improve it by going back to the EU. Meanwhile, the EU were going, what, you again? I thought we'd dealt with I thought we'd finished this. And then uh, meanwhile, the MPs and the Speaker of the uh, House of Commons are all getting together going, look, this is ridiculous. We've got to try and do something about this. We need to be able to vote on various other possibilities. It can't just be this deal and uh, crashing out, right, guys? And so they're all coming up with these amendments to the parliamentary process, as you said, which basically giving uh, the House of Commons the right to vote on various other options, as you described. And then on the 29th of January, there'll be lots of voting going on in the House of Commons, voting on the various amendments and voting on Theresa May's clarified deal, which probably will be almost exactly the same as the, the deal that uh, she put to the Commons before. Yes, but, I think that's what's uh, going to happen. And her whole, her whole argument of, I'm going to go and get clarification, maybe she'll be able to get a few details of the backstop amended or, or whatever, or renegotiated, but essentially this is her kicking the can down the road so that ultimately commons has got kind of no choice either they vote for her deal or or they allow the country to crash out unless this plan of all these different amendments uh kind of works and i don't really get what would happen well, the parliament is trying to uh decide what kind of deal it would vote for and get a majority for it's very cumbersome indeed at this very late stage to be uh having lots of MPs with different views arguing the toss about the issues that are outstanding and trying to come up with something. So uh, one thing that I think is quite likely to happen is um, a delay of the Article 50 process, meaning uh, the deadline of March the 29th when we're due to leave the EU at 11 o'clock in the evening. Um, That's in law, but they could pass a law to say we're going to extend it. And the EU have indicated that if that's what we want, then we can do it. Uh, I think that under all these scenarios, with uh, just over two months left, a delay to that deadline is quite possible. Mm. But it's um, it's a struggle because Theresa May doesn't want to delay it. She would have to be find herself defeated by the Commons to get there. And also, there's a thing called the European Parliament elections coming up in May. Mm. End of May, every five years, the European Parliament has its elections. Um, at the moment, I think there are 751 members of Parliament in, in Strasbourg. The transition agreement, or sorry, um, the uh, withdrawal agreement, mm-hmm. um, says, of course, we won't have any MEPs after the 29th of March. So Britain would not be taking part in the European elections. But if we're still a member uh, in May because we delayed the process, um, that rather makes it makes it somewhat complicated because the, the plan is that some of the British parliamentary seats would be distributed to other countries and some of them would not be filled, reducing the number of MEPs uh, down to, I can't remember the number, Luke, 720, something like that. Um, well, it starts uh, at yeah. 751. Yeah, about 720, I think, would be would remain. And can you imagine trying to conduct an election where you don't know whether Britain's in it or not, and you don't know how many seats are going to be contested? Right. So, yeah, it's impossible. 
So the M, the basically the EU are saying you probably going to say, okay, you can uh, choose to delay Article Fifty, but you can't delay it any further than May. Or they might say, all right, you want to extend it by a year, okay, you'll part take part in the European elections, but when you do leave, all the MEPs will have to go home. So we would still have to put forth candidates for. Uh, the European part, like Britain's candidates for the European Parliament, would still have to be put forth. Uh, the public would still vote on uh, our candidates for the European Parliament. It's all speculation. I don't know, Luke. Okay. Um, all I'm saying is that delaying uh, our exit does have that little fly in the ointment. The um, difficulty over the European elections coming up in May, it might not stop it. Um, if if the Parliament voted to delay this and uh, revoke the law it passed saying we will leave on the 29th, um, then I suppose they'd get round it in some way. But it's just a, an issue. You were saying how uh, in Brussels they're saying, you know, here they come again. We've told you we've finished negotiating. Jean-Claude Juncker, the, um, the president of the European Commission, a few days ago, did a did a little he's a jokey character uh, he did a thing from uh, the spice girls hit he said tell us what they want what they really really want <laughs> and uh, that's their position they say you know we're sitting here while um, the uk can't decide what it wants because its parliament is divided even its government is divided and um, you know they can't actually uh, agree the deal the prime minister struck listeners are you confused if you yes. are that's normal i am too at this point we're kind of talking about what might happen next okay the the other thing is of course that the the business community which is so important to the economy is getting more and more uh, nervous about the fact we don't know what's going to happen and um, every day it seems to me that we're getting news that certain important businesses are thinking of moving to within the eu yeah um yesterday it was sony headquarters the european headquarters of sony is in the uk music um yeah Isn't electronics it? um big electronics company yeah and they're going to move their hq out of out of britain panasonic have already announced they're going to do it and today as i speak uh, uh airbus who have their the, their wings made in this country are saying quite specifically that if we crash out without any kind of a deal, they will uh, probably um, close their factory and move the wing making to within the EU. They I've... need to have some certainty about you know, the raw materials and the finished goods going across borders without any problem. I actually found a an amazing thread on Twitter by um, a guy called Edwin Haywood, and it's all completely fact checked. And he says, this is a super massive realities of Brexit thread, all about the number of jobs which are either going or have already gone, the the investment drying up, firms moving their assets into uh, the European Union. For example, we've got, and I'll just rush, run through some of them, Barden Corporation is closing down its Plymouth factory after 51 years, putting 400 jobs at risk as its parent company Schaefer shifts production to various sites outside the UK due to Brexit. And I remember all this is all this stuff is backed up with reports. Pfizer um, have already spent a million, a hundred million dollars on Brexit preparations. The government has spent four point two billion pounds of taxpayers' money on Brexit preparations. Eight health providers have warned of medicine shortages in the event of a No Deal Brexit. HSBC, the bank, announced in its 2017 annual report that it had incurred $28 million of costs associated with the UK's exit from the EU. Chubb, the world's largest publicly traded property and casualty insurance company, is redomiciling from the UK to France. It's already received permission from the French regulator and aims to complete its move on the 1st of January so that's probably already happened. Uh, and the list goes on. Schaefer, yes. uh, you know, uh, it's just, so it goes on and see, on and see, on. You can see why a big majority of members of parliament um, don't want a no-deal Brexit. Nobody does. So as we were mentioning earlier, I believe that Theresa May has this uh, Armageddon to say, it's, it, you don't want that, so you'll have to accept my deal. And I think she, you know, she still hopes that she'll bring people round. You've certainly got to admit that Theresa May doesn't change her mind much 
Um, she's um, called stubborn, or if you prefer, resolute, but uh, she just keeps on going. And um, even though she's not the most popular prime minister, one thing you can say for her is she does keep going. Are you going to go to questions for your listeners? Because you sent me one or two. Yeah, I, I've got, I've one, got one questions from... Said, I've got, yeah. What's the effect of, do you think she'll just say, oh, I've had enough and quit? <laughs> Uh, no, she won't. We'll come to those questions in a moment. I just need to just uh, clear clear up a few loose ends. So we've we've talked about what no deal Brexit would look like, but what's the uh, likelihood of no deal Brexit happening? Do you think? I think that it's um, it's frighteningly quite likely. I mean, I don't I don't know. I, it might even be fifty fifty at the moment. Mm. Um, mm. The uh, I think that a delay is more likely. And I think Theresa May getting the Commons to agree a tweaked deal is unlikely. One thing's for sure, we are actually now on the path to crashing out with no deal, because if things carry on as they are now, when the 29th of March rolls around and we are in the same position we're in now, then we will crash out. So that is actually what is going to happen based on the current situation. So we're heading right. for it, directly heading heading for it right now. It's a the default position. Yeah, so the, the train is is heading towards the the uh, I don't know what is what would it be like the the edge of the cliff or something. Yes, yes, and we're so going off a cliff. We're the attempt- white cliffs of Dover. We're attempting to now find ways to uh, redirect the train or stop the train or something. But the train is heading for well, what from our point of view it is a cliff. But for some people, it's it's an exhilarating um, like what would it be a, a leap into the, a world of opportunity. And what for want for some people, but for us, it's just a train f- flying off the edge of a cliff and smashing on the rocks below. I've never really been able to understand why so many people want to leave the EU. I really don't understand it. Um, the, the the politicians, I think, are simply uh, instinctive nationalists, and they don't like to be, you know, told what to do by these people in Brussels. And they they believe that we can be released to do fantastic trade deals with the rest of the world. At the moment, if you're an EU member state, you don't do international trade deals on your own. The EU does it as a bloc. Mm-hmm. So they have a you know EU trade deal with uh, Japan quite recently. And um, the the individual countries don't have the freedom to strike a different deal with Japan. And that's one of the things that the Brexiteers, as they like to call themselves, think would be a big advantage to us. Personally, I think the disadvantages are so enormous that, uh, and it would take a long, long time to negotiate better trade deals with the rest of the world. I think it's a fantasy. So that's, you know, it's my personal view. I think so I don't really understand why so many people uh, voted for uh, Brexit. And I think it was for a variety of reasons. Yeah. The, the, uh, you know, as we've said before, um, the, the parts of the country that voted to leave are the poorer parts of the country in the Midlands and the North, the old industrial areas which have uh, suffered from the lack of manufacturing and, um, and some of the poorer areas along the South Coast. The, the, the reasons why they've voted for it is probably dissatisfaction with everything and they talk about the out-of-touch Westminster elite and the out-of-touch unelected brussels elite and um they just think that they wanted to be heard they wanted to stand up and say i've taken it all i don't want it anymore i want something different not to mention the fact of course that the leave campaign was technically illegally funded and that it um did tell a lot of untruths which weren't properly counted at the time yeah i think you know the eu also to a large extent has just become a sort of straw man Uh, it's a scapegoat for all the problems that people are experiencing and things that they're unhappy about to a large extent the reasons why people voted for brexit were because it was the british government that probably they had a beef with but because the the newspapers that they read because it's the daily mail and the sun and so on uh tell them i don't know it sounds very patronizing to say well they didn't know what they were voting for and that's because they were stupid it does and if you say that to people they resent it enormously as you can imagine um and uh the, uh, it doesn't doesn't get you anywhere because it just makes them um, even more angry. But I do, but I do uh, honestly but believe I that they believe that the newspapers have been a very very significant factor. And it's For been years and years. The the popular press has been dominated by anti-European sentiment and anti-European stories for such a long time 
uh, that uh, and they are still virulently uh, pro Brexit. Um, the ones you mentioned, the Sun is the biggest selling newspaper. The Mail is very popular. The Express, the Telegraph, the Times, to a certain extent, yeah. and uh, and it must have an impact. If the year after year after year, you you get get the feeling that that Brussels is out of touch, te- telling us what to do, incompetent, doesn't to handle the migration crisis. The euro was in trouble. Everything that comes out of Brussels is trouble. And um, people say, well, why don't we just leave? And yeah. Everybody's so tired of this process that that's a common feeling around you know, the country. When, uh, when reporters ask the man in the street and the woman in the street, what do you think about Brexit? They almost universally say, oh, I'm fed up with the whole thing. The politicians are useless. Why don't we just leave? Yeah, but the reality of why don't we just leave would mean crashing out without any kind of deals in place. And... Okay, so the, you, whenever you end up in a conversation with a Brexiter, which, to be honest, doesn't happen that much in my life, although I do observe lots and lots of conversations on social media and also on YouTube, just watching people's conversations on YouTube and also the comment sections on YouTube videos. This is kind of how – this is where I see people discussing this stuff. And usually I see that the Brexiters – just come out with the same kind of buzzwords, the same rhetoric that they've read in the newspapers. And it's it's the same things every time, like we're taking back control or we're going to trade on world trade organization rules and certain just phrases that come out. But when they are actually asked to give details on what that actually means, they are lost for words and they, they get angry and well, uh, yes. I mean, again, we, one can't generalize too much. It's quite interesting if you like, um, historically, if you talk about the nature of democracy, that um, the the popular politicians, the populist movements that are going on around Europe and elsewhere, um, keep on talking about the will of the people. Um, you know, the people will decide, the people have voted, the people have spoken – um, and the uh, the parliamentary elite are out of touch with the people, and it's a constant mantra it has been for for centuries actually that how what is the will of the people and people embrace it and say I represent the will of the people the the referendum was the will of the people well it certainly wasn't the will of the people there isn't one will of the people you know there are the wills of the peoples but. A simplistic referendum question, do you want to leave the EU or not, doesn't actually address any of the issues. And, you know, the question ought to be, well, if you do, what kind of, what kind of departure do you want? Yeah. And now here we are wrangling over this, sort of trapped by this very narrow victory for the leave camp in the referendum result two and a half years ago. It seems to me to be insane. But that's the way it is. Because when the referendum was set up originally in 2016, the people who actually put it forwards didn't expect the, the people to vote leave. David- I think David Cameron definitely thought that the leave side wouldn't win and he would have got rid of the issue. He went into an election with a, a promise uh, that there would be a referendum on the EU and he, he sort of did a little tour around Europe uh, to get a better deal for Britain. And he came back with his better deal for Britain and said, well, we'll put that to the EU. Well, of course, the better deal for Britain was uh, next to nothing. It wasn't worth the paper it wasn't written on. Mm. And uh, the, the, uh, they misjudged it terribly. And the Remain campaign was a disunited, uh, not particularly enthusiastic and not particularly brilliant one. Yeah. Um, and uh, both Theresa May and the leader of the opposition campaigned to remain in the EU, but not with any enthusiasm or passion. Yeah. The passion was all on the other side. So, I mean, that's one reason why we're in the situation we're in now, because the the uh, the referendum was, I mean, set up in in a way that made it incredibly difficult to. I mean, like, yeah, as you said, the ballot paper was just, do you want to leave or not? And people voted to leave for all these different reasons, which to an extent are impossible to bring together in reality. 
I, I'm very much against referendums, full stop. I believe in the parliamentary democracy. And asking a very simple question about a hugely complicated issue is not a good idea. Yeah, okay. There are other potential outcomes that I'd like to mention, even before we get to any of my listeners' questions. Yes, your listeners will be saying, wait a minute, isn't anyone going to answer my questions? <laughs> um, I think that I might divide this into two episodes, which is fine. So... What else? Uh, No deal Brexit. Okay, we've talked about that. Article 50 being postponed. We've talked about that, that it might be difficult to to, uh, postpone it beyond the... Well, it's just my thought. But if you ask me to to bet um, a a five euro note whether it'll be postponed or not, I would put my money down that it will be postponed. Okay. We don't know how long, though. No. Okay. Another deal led by Theresa May and the Conservatives. Well, this will be the deal that she's going to put to Parliament on the 29th of uh, January. But you you believe that uh, they'll vote that one down as well? Yes, if it's not much different from the one they voted down so heavily before, it will be voted down again. How these amendments will play out, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, they are what I call indicative votes. It means that the the vote wouldn't be binding and suddenly become law it would be showing what mps will uh, will vote for what commands a majority what issues command a majority so i think that if we've gone through some of those amendment votes the next logical thing to do is for the government to go away and take account of them and come back with a deal which does take account of them and then what it would be theresa may who goes with all those amendments well, yes, but you've still got this collision between um, the House of Commons and the government. The, the, you know, it's a real collision. So if the, even if the House of uh, Houses of Parliament say, look, we have voted as a majority house that we should stay in the customs union, and Theresa May has ruled that one out. But would, so would she say, oh, all right then? Um, no, she which, won't. So, uh, you know, we have this collision. Yeah. So we don't know. I think a delay is getting more and more likely. But we don't know even if even if the uh, amendments, you know, if the House does clarify its position, who's going to actually go to the EU to try and uh, negotiate based on those amendments, and and how successful would they be? Because um, again, I, the, don't, the, I don't know, Luke. Yeah, I don't well, know. These are just sort of um, rhetorical questions, <laughs> really. The, 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 there are various speculations going on. One of them is uh, the men in grey suits. Now, do you know what that phrase means? The men in the grey suits. Well, no, literally what it means. It means male uh, male humans wearing <laughs> grey coloured uh, yes. business wear. Oh, it's a, it's a nice nice phrase, and in political circles in this country, most people understand what that means. Um, it, it's a very nice kind of analogy. If if let's start here. If you've gone kind of slightly crazy, uh, men in white suits come and take you away. Men in white coats. Many white coats. Thank you. Yeah. So the men in grey suits are the are the party um, old timers, the party experienced people, and we're talking now about the Conservative Party, who arrive at Theresa May's door. <laughs> uh, no, they're not going to carry her away uh, wearing white coats, but they're going to sit her down and say, "Your time's up, Theresa." That's what happened to Margaret Thatcher. Uh, well, it was a technical thing there. The, she she was voted out by the party members through the process. Oh, okay. As, all right. But this is outside the process, basically saying you've had it, Theresa. You've lost the support of the party and you've got to step down and let someone else have a go. Oh, okay. Well, I think that's unlikely. But there has been one or two columnists writing the newspapers saying that's one of the possibilities coming up that wouldn't be too scandalous because when the country's voted in the general election and the conservatives with the help of the the dup were able to form a government the the people hadn't voted for theresa may they voted for the conservatives so it's not unthinkable that the conservatives would say to theresa may look off you go we're going to replace you with someone else I, i have to be clear as she would say uh, I have to be clear. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think that uh, she will plough on. And the problem for the Conservative Party is if they said, well, she is no longer got our respect and we need somebody else. The question is, who would the somebody else be? And remember, the party is deeply split over Brexit. 
And so, you know, the party members out there in the country all like Boris Johnson because he's a bit of a character. And he would perhaps represent the Brexit camp, the hard Brexit camp, lead at any cost. But there are plenty of Conservative MPs who would actually have a fit if that happened. And they would much rather have uh, what you might call a centrist or even a Remainer to step in uh, to Theresa's shoes. They wouldn't be able to decide. Yeah. So I don't think they, that she'll be forced to, to resign by the party. Whether there's a general election or not, that's difficult to see as well. Um, the only way that would happen would be a number of conservative uh, MPs who were very strongly in favour of remaining in the EU would rebel and would vote with Labour if they went into a, a vote of no confidence promising that they would have a soft or softer or even no Brexit. OK, another possibility. What about just no Brexit at all? What about the the, op, the, the likelihood of the whole thing just being cancelled completely? What a wonderful idea. Um, <laughs> that would be uh, probably... A good thing from my point of view, because, uh, you know, everybody's fed up with it and it would uh, bring us back to um, what I think is by far the best deal of all that is being in the EU. But I think it's unlikely. Um, the Certainly the government says that we must respect the referendum result. Um, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of, of the opposition, says much the same. There are others who would be delighted if we, we stopped it. Uh, it would solve all these problems that have, have uh, grown up. The SNP, the Scottish National Party, are hostile to Brexit. Um, but I can't see it happening, really. Um, I think the only mechanism to mean we don't leave the EU would be a second referendum. And uh, a second referendum where people would have, some people would have changed their minds and we've got a changed demographic situation, which is quite interesting. A lot of young people weren't old enough to vote or hadn't registered to vote on the first referendum and uh, the analysis shows that overwhelmingly it was older people who voted to leave the EU and younger people who wanted to stay in it since they're internationalists and they get a lot of benefit from being able to travel around. Uh, so um, I think that uh, the next vote would be more likely to come out in favour of remaining. The people who are against all this talk about civil unrest and um, how uh, it would completely um, divorce the people from the democratic process if we didn't respect the referendum. I'm not sure about that. I think that the people already completely fed up with the politicians and have despair of the democratic process because Brexit has exposed these great rifts. And the government has been spectacularly incompetent in uh, in the last two and a half years since they triggered Article 50, or since the referendum. So um, I don't know about industrial-type uh, unrest. You know, we've had minor strikes in this country. We've had riots in this country in poor parts of the cities. Would people riot over the fact that they voted to leave, and, but we haven't? I don't know, you know, they, they, they might. I mean, we had in Paris the Gilets Jaunes movement, or the Yellow Jackets, and maybe people who would be so infuriated by their Brexit dreams being overturned. They'd be so infuriated by the idea that democracy was being curtailed and that the government, this kind of autocratic government or something, was taking over control of the, you know, against the will of the people. Uh, people might be so angry that, yeah, they might, there might be civil unrest. I could imagine it, but it might not be on a huge scale. You might get groups of sort of hooligan types um, yes, it, might, causing but, trouble, uh, I could imagine that it would kick off. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are small, very far right groups um, which are already abusive, threatening MPs, threatening them, you know, with death. They remember that was um, a, a Labour MP called um, Joe Cox. Cox. Joe Cox, who actually got murdered by a guy shouting "traitor" because she was uh, against Brexit. All sorts of nasty people out there. Um, no, I think that if we didn't leave the EU, the, it would be a political uh, earthquake uh, rather than mass civil unrest. The political earthquake means you'd get, get a return of a, a hard right-wing anti-European party, even though UKIP, uh, United Kingdom Independence Party, was very um, important in forcing the referendum in the first place, even though they didn't have any MPs or only one or two, they uh, collected an awful lot of support 
and the Conservatives wanted to um, stop that happening and get their, their supporters back, which is why they, you know, went for the referendum. If there was a second vote, now that we know more, then I think that the UKIP party would suddenly pop up again or in some other form, and the Conservatives in particular would uh, lose support to them, which is another reason why they want to uh, see this through and not have a second referendum. Yeah, okay. I certainly, even if they're... Even if Brexit doesn't happen, I think the conditions and the movements that kind of have led to it happening uh, would not just go away. In fact, they might even get stronger because people would feel angry because uh, yes, it, it hadn't it's, happened. It's interesting, isn't it? I think I need to go to the questions from listeners. Now, we've already hmm. talked for over an hour, Dad. Well, you have to edit it down, Luke, otherwise they'll all <laughs> sort of collapse from exhaustion out there. Well, hopefully you haven't collapsed from exhaustion out there because of all the confusing politics. You're okay, aren't you? Yeah, you're all right. Enjoying this? Yes, of course you are. It's the Rick Thompson Report. It's kind of a privilege to be able to listen to my dad on the podcast. It's a privilege for me to be able to have him on the podcast. I should say a big thank you to him for his contribution. Thanks, Dad. Uh, So this is where I'm going to stop this part, part one. But the conversation will continue in part two, and we're going to answer some questions from listeners which I received this week on social media. So that's part two, which should go up pretty soon. It should be published soon. It might even be available for you now, depending on when you're listening to this. If it's not up yet, it just means I'm still working on it, and it will be published as soon as it's ready, so you can check it out then. Thanks uh, again for listening. Thanks again to my dad for his contribution. But for now, for this part, it's just time to say goodbye. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. 